Good morning. Good to have all of you with us today uh, for this Power Players webinar. We are at a crucial point in time, two days before the launch of the big recovery strategy by the European Commission. So what has all this crisis done to the power sector, to the broader European economy? When can we bounce back to normal? And what is this going to do for the energy transition? Are we going to see a slowdown or an actual acceleration? And what is the role of policy in all this? Those are some of the questions that we're going to discuss today. And um, we have with us a stellar lineup of people. We have our very own president, Mr. Magnus Hall from uh, Vattenfall. We have Francesco Staracci, who is the CEO of NL. We have Alistair Phillips Davis, uh, the CEO of um, SSE. We have Jean-Marc uh, Olanier, who is the CEO of um, Accenture in Europe. And we have, last but not least, Sandrine dixon de Cleve, who is the co-president of the Club of Rome and one of the 30 most uh, um, influential women, according to Greenbiz, uh, in the green energy transition. So we're going to have a, a discussion where we uh, basically go in two parts. Uh, to begin with, we're going to try to focus on the economy. What are the impacts on the power sector? Uh, what are the impacts on the broader economy and how can we foresee a bounce back to normal or perhaps a new normal? In the second part, we're then going to go for the question about the energy transition. What are the impacts of the energy, tr energy transition uh, of this uh, economic crisis we're seeing? Uh, are we going to see a delay or are we going to see an actual acceleration? And what can this um, recovery strategy of the EU, what can the measures to stimulate the economy actually do in this regard? So that's uh, in a nutshell what we're going to discuss today. We'll see if we find time for some uh, questions as well from the, from the audience. And, um, and I hope uh, you'll have a, a great time with this uh, fantastic panel of speakers. Before we kick off, however, let's try to have a poll and, um, and, and hear the views of, of the many people uh, that are with us here. Uh, we had more than 650 registrants uh, for this webinar this morning, and uh, we can see that they're still joining as we are speaking. But if I could ask the control room to, to bring up the poll, uh, which is um, how long will it take the EU economy to recover fully from the COVID-19? Will it take less than two years? Will it take two to four years or will it take more than four years? Can we see that again, please? So if we give people just a little bit of additional time to vote and you basically just vote by clicking on the screen. Then we have a chance to um, get the answers from people and can we get the results displayed on screen and or can you send me through a screenshot on my phone so that I can see it as well. We are seeing a small delay here. Meanwhile, while we try to fix this, um, let's maybe start the discussion. Magnus, we are in an unprecedented time. We have uh, we've been seeing. Uh, some some very significant changes in uh, in the market. Um, in some countries, uh, the dip has been very deep, a bit less so in Sweden. Um, looking at your at your balance sheet, has has this had an impact at all, and and uh, and and to what extent? Yes, um, if we talk about the various parts of Europe, and of course this whole question uh, really tests the resilience of the utility industry in general, and of course also us, uh, we have a little bit what what we would call double trouble up up in the north because um, in our country we have had so much rain and we have had so much wind and we have had a warm winter, which means that you really put pressure on our electricity markets. Right now we see negative prices just this weekend. 
uh, but we have continuously prices between five to ten euro a megawatt hour and of course nobody can build a business on anything like that now uh, most companies are like we are we are hedged uh, so we won't uh, deal have to deal with that immediately uh, but on the other hand if the long-term prices are as low as they are now we will still heading uh, in, in significant troubles i would say um, so we're really fighting that and, and the, the COVID-19 situation from three perspectives, we take three priorities. The first thing is to make sure that our people are safe. The second thing is, of course, for everybody to make sure that we have security supply under control. It means both from a pandemic view that we keep our people healthy and can use them for, for the running of our operations, but also for maintenance of our uh, big operations. Specifically, if you have like we have nuclear in Sweden, we just flew in on a separate plane technicians to make sure that we can make the maintenance necessary to keep things going. So it's really a, a challenge which we are up to. And I think the second, the third part of that is, of course, also trying to protect our companies financially. <clears throat> and at the same time as we're doing that, trying to save money, uh, we will also have to look to protect our long term strategy. So there is quite a lot going on right here in the north. Uh, but uh, let's hear what's happening also uh, in the rest of Europe. To you, Christian. So, so I, I like that uh, term "double trouble." On the one hand, a uh, significant slowdown. On the other hand, um, some 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 very uh, distinct weather weather patterns across Europe, actually, with a lot of rain, uh, more mild weather, and and perhaps also for other types of renewable generation, some quite favorable conditions. Um, what what does that do to your investment strategy? Does that look exactly like it did uh, in December 2019, or, or have you made some 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 adjustments to to the strategy in order to to guard liquidity and make sure that you you have the full capacity to run your your core operations? Absolutely, uh, we have uh, worked through a program where we look both at our opex and our cap and, and our investments going forward. And I think it's quite obvious also to uh, we were participating in a big project for an offshore wind park outside the Netherlands called the uh, uh, Hollandse Coast Nord. Uh, we actually were participating, but then we decided to abolish it because we felt that the uncertainty of the future uh, is there. But at the same time, we're protecting the near term big investments we're going to do, which are part of our strategy. So I think we will see. Um, still, the, the, the industry being um, prepared to take the short term, the, the long term investments that we see in front of us. But of course, you have to take a, 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 a candid view or, or, or a protective view on, on some of the investments that you have. So for sure, we're doing that. Thank you, Francesco. Um... We, we saw an estimate from um, from from uh, Platts that basically said they uh, expect utilities to reduce their overall investments by 10 to 15 percent as a consequence of, of these uh, different trends that that are basically impacting our sector but also the broader economy. Is that something you can recognize from your company? And are you do, doing uh, things the same way as Magnus, or or how's the situation? Uh, in, in your part of the world that has been hit very, very hard uh, by the lockdown measures and, and the slowdown in the economy. I think we need to hear you, Francesco. Let's see. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, no, we don't see a slowdown in the, in the investment cycle uh, in 2020 and most likely 21. Um, as a result of this CEO on COVID-19. What, what I can say is that, you know, this uh, Southern Europe, so Spain and Italy, basically, uh, we have observed the full cycle at this point. You know, we've seen the lockdown and we've seen also the lifting of the lockdown. So what happens after, you know, we, we're finally free to get out and, and start in the factories and in the shops and, and everywhere else, our normal life. And uh, what, what can be seen is that, yeah, we, we got a decrease in uh, electricity demand, obviously. Uh, industry and, and commerce went, went down. Domestic was up, obviously. Um, the net result is still a uh, slump of about 10%. Um, after the, the lockdown is lifted, we see demand kept picking up again. So I would say this is kind of a of a system that has to to go through the full swing before we really assess the final impact 
no one really knows no, really the impact and the implications widely of this uh, of this uh, full cycle what we see is that the reopening is a cautious one so you don't have a big boom a big bang uh, a big party it's kind of mm, slowly building up uh, gradually and people are very cautious about this overall i think around the world is going to be the same we have similar patterns evolving in at this point in greece in romania uh, somehow in Russia, and the full of Latin America, where we were, we have a big presence, is at this moment where Europe was a month ago, so in lockdown. But you can say the same because of the same cycle is happening, and because economies are all interconnected, it will take a while for the whole thing to really come back to some kind of an equilibrium. And at that point, you can say what kind of investment uh, is going to be needed if uh, wednesday as we all expect the commission will uh, relaunch uh, on the green deal as a big tool to kick start the recovery in europe maybe uh, plus is going to be proven wrong probably the utilities will have a big a big a big uh, part of the investment uh, role accelerating the transition rather than just waiting for something to happen that's um that's that we'll get back to that part of the discussion in, in your view looking at, at the poll figures we had before um it, it's a little bit more uh, optimistic than, than i would have thought we had 50 percent uh thinks that it's going to be less than two years 40 percent thinks it's going to be less than five and only 10 think it's going to be a, a very prolonged um, economic crisis we're in what's your personal take i think it all depends on how quickly the u.s gets out of this because uh, 40 million of uh, people unemployed in the u.s cannot be sustained for a long time uh, so today the package they have lets them have uh, some clarity for two months so after that, they will stop paying mortgages and stop buying. And I think that will trigger, that could trigger a totally different non, non uh, sideline, but not, not small uh, recession. So it very much depends on how quickly the US goes back on their feet. It's, it's basically very much focused on that. Thank you. Alistair, over to you. You have, uh, Magnus has double trouble. Maybe you have triple trouble uh, with, uh, with a Brexit on top of everything. Um, when we look at, at how uh, the, the load has been, uh, been, been taking uh, its development in, in uh, the UK, um, you can really see that the lockdown came a bit uh, later, but also that, that the dip uh, continues a little bit longer than in some of the other economies. The, the, the return is a bit slower. What is the situation in your company? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Christian. Uh, I think we did go into lockdown a little, a little bit later, though maybe not quite as late as Sweden, uh, who, who sort of ploughed a slightly different path altogether. Uh, in Scotland, we're still in it. Um, you've got some issues in this country that the devolved administrations of Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland are doing things at a slightly different pace to um, to England uh, as well. So you've got all those different things happening. Uh, I think on facts and figures, we're we're back at a, around about a 14% reduction in demand. We peaked at about 20. I think maybe Italy saw the biggest peak at about minus 25, but they're, they're, they're back slightly better than us at sort of 12 or 13. I'm sure Francesca will know better than me. So I, I think across the year, we're probably seeing maybe, uh, or certainly across the summer, probably a 10% reduction. Um, what we'll, we'd be expecting, will we get it picking up again in the winter? Uh, but again, I still think three to five percent reduction across the winter. So big reductions in demand. We've seen some of the negative prices that uh, Magnus talked about. We we had a big storm over the uh, over the weekend, so we had a lot of wind. We have a, a bank holiday, a public holiday today um, uh, across the UK. So prices minus twenty nine pounds on Saturday, minus forty nine pounds on Sunday. So really, really big negative prices. Uh, balancing the systems, getting more of an issue. 
because you had so much wind on, people were constraining off wind farms um, and you're sort of bringing on a thermal plant to try and provide stability there. Um, uh, we've seen National Grid come out and say there could be up to half a billion pounds worth of additional costs this summer for balancing the system in order to cope with uh, low demands. So I think I think there's 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 quite a lot going on there. I think you've got a government that's obviously stepped in and provided a lot of certainty um, to you know uh, on a longer time frame um, than the uh, than the U.S. government has done to date, uh, which I think has helped. But definitely the economy needs to get going again. Um, we bo we borrowed in the last month more than we've uh, more than we borrowed in all of last year in the U.K. So I think I think there's a really important transition there, um, and we're also seeing some interesting trends. I think I'm, a, I'm not a virologist, but as far as I can tell, London's seen a massive drop in the number of cases it's had. So the effects there have been quite pronounced in the rest of the country. You've seen that um, that sort of tailing off of reported cases and deaths uh, being slower than probably people wanted, which is why you're seeing some of the uh, outlying regions hanging on to things. So it's 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 quite an interesting picture. And just quickly touching on investment, um, you know, uh, like Francesco says, I, I think we live in a big uh, interlinked economy. Some of the biggest economies in the world, if if they really struggle, then I think that 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 gives us a problem. I'd be amazed if we got out of this in two years. If we get out of it in less than five, I think people will have done well uh, and uh, politicians will be able to pat themselves on the back. And on the investment side, I think everybody at the moment, I'm, I work for a, a, a public company where obviously um, we've got shareholders. I think people will look to conserve cash. People will look to, um, uh, uh, look to cut spending of all sorts at the moment because of issues um, with demand coming down. But I do think there is a huge opportunity in the UK, which will play into strongly, which will mirror what's going on, uh, hopefully in the rest of Europe, for actually a green revolution to help bring us out of that. Um, ultimately, policymakers and politicians, they're going to be faced with a situation where they've got uh, a lot more unemployment than they had several months ago and a lot less money to play with. So if we can bring forward um, investment plans and opportunities that provide jobs, I think that's the really important thing to do. I think there's still a lot of cash in the world looking for homes, but it's um, it's it's being able to access that cash by essentially creating policies where they think they'll get a long term return. Um, and I think uh, I, I think we're ideally placed as an industry, um, as you know, Francesco said in the past when he was president, and Magnus is, uh, is saying currently for us to really um, help be a, a key part of the investment and recovery. We need to create new jobs, which is what politicians want. And I think there's that opportunity, <clears throat> but you're not quite there yet uh, in terms of being able to have those conversations, but it's certainly something we want to start. Thank you, Alistair. So, so you and Francesco both touched on, on, on the crucial importance of, of the US coming back to, if not normal, but 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 start picking up again. We're, we're really seeing some 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 astonishing um, unemployment figures over there. Um, but I guess a vaccine or some sort of cure for the COVID will, will be important uh, for this. What are your expectations for, for the timeline of such a, a cure? Um, this is something we're all looking into, but I also know that you're in touch with, uh, with Bill Gates and others that, that, um, that, that are really closely involved with the, in this. Sure. I, well, I've heard Bill speak on it, uh, and I was I was uh, having discussions with um, the the leaders of the Wellcome Trust. That's one of the biggest charities in the UK. They put about a billion pounds a year into medical research. Um, uh, look, I, th I think there are a lot of groups out there developing that. I think there are 210 projects globally at the moment looking at doing things. I think you've you've got. Um, somewhere between four and 10 of them starting trials now. Some of them started trials, uh, I think, uh, only 60 days after the genome became available. So there's a lot of interesting work going on. Um, and I suppose if I go back to my youth, um, you know, HIV and, and AIDS was a big thing. Uh, we, we never had a vaccine. We've never had a vaccine for AIDS, but we control it in other ways. And therefore, society lives with it. Uh, and I think the way in which uh, we're all going to live with COVID will be very interesting. I just don't know. It, it would be fantastic if we could have a vaccine that works. Obviously, the, there's one that o Oxford and AstraZeneca have, uh, um, are committing to, 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 to try and build. Um, I know Zenofi are doing work as well. So there's a, there's a whole lot of people out there. 
Um, and, and I think the thing is, this time, unlike um, the common cold in the past, Mars, uh, uh, Mears and Zars, the previous versions of these, and even things like Ebola, um, everything is being thrown at this in terms of the vast amounts of money. So hopefully a vaccine comes and that would be a huge benefit. And actually there may be two or three different vaccines that, that are actually proved to some extent successful. Equally, any of the thera therapeutics that come, people have talked about remdesivir, uh, there's another drug where uh, people's T cells are very low when they get very ill, so um, treatments to to boost that. So I, I think we need to try, uh, and we clearly will be trying absolutely everything to try and get out of this. But there's probably a warning in here that um, countries, the UK, the US, other ones I see, need to be spending more money on looking at how they deal with emergencies like this, so that uh, so that we're a lot more prepared and then building facilities to manufacture mass manufacture vaccines. Different vaccines get manufactured in a different way. I think we're going to need to invest to put uh, facilities in place because we don't know which one of those vaccines is going to win. So a lot of interesting stuff, but I'm, I'm not a doctor. So um, uh, check out with your physician. But probably uh, I'm not sure where you should go for Donald Trump's physician. Who knows? He's, he's, he's obviously got some interesting stuff going on there. As long as you don't drink bleach, uh, I'm, I'm all good. Um, John Mark, uh, over to you. Um, you you uh, you have a, a long track record also dealing with with the power sector, um, but uh, but in Accenture you also look really across sectors. So 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 you have a bit of a broader view on 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 how the power sector stacks up uh, uh, compared to the rest of the economy, and and um, and also a, a good view on on what has happened and, and what just might happen in terms of, of, of how the economies are rebounding. No, thanks, Christian, and uh, good morning to uh, to everybody here. Yes, uh, you know, we have to be, uh, you know, a cognizant that uh, this crisis is pretty unique and unprecedented in many ways. Never, nevertheless, you know, since we have seen this coming out of China and after moving east to Italy, Europe, and now in the US, we develop a model around, you know, how do we see the impact across the different industries? And, and we see, you know, as a first way, which is pretty clear today, that we have three grouping of industry around the planet. We test that model in China, in Europe, and now in the US, and it seems to be working pretty well. The, the one group which is around the industry severely impacted, where the business model will have to change. We talk about travel industry, retail, you know, industrial equipment, car industry, oil and gas. This is a grouping of industry where business model will be severely impacted by COVID. Another group of industry on the other side, which is significantly benefiting from COVID. You know, I'm talking about health industry, pharma industry, everything related to government, life science, and frankly, also all the pure play of digital on tech, which is really benefiting today from the large scale digital transformation. So those two grouping are clear. In the middle, you have a group of industry that are navigating the crisis, as I say, on, on utilities is part of that group, as we can see today, like teleco telecommunication, banking, insurance, consumer goods, technology in the broader sense, where it is all about navigating the crisis. And I would say we three stepped into it. The first steps being everything regarding safety of people and business resilience, you know, supplying the customer. This is mostly done across this group, and that's what the power sector, frankly, has done pretty well across Europe, because I think, uh, you know, hopefully uh, a couple of industry has been extremely resilient to navigate the crisis. We are more today dealing with, you know, core issues related to that, you know, cash position, how do you continue to sell with a multi-channel distribution, a distribution of a digital channel, supply chain resilience, and everything related to balance sheet position. This is what we do today. This is what we do in the power sector. This is what we do across all those industries that are in that uh, middle grouping. The key question though is what's next? And the what's next is uh, what many people say. I'm not sure we know. Frankly, we don't know two months ago what COVID was. I'm not sure we start to know the impact of it. I'm not sure we know completely the recovery of it. I think the couple of learning we have, and that has been mentioned already, is that it's going to be different by industry, it's going to be different by region, and frankly, it's going to be still linked to the pandemic situation. You know, the way we get into it has been through industry and region. It's likely that the way we get out of it, you know, will be the same. And with very different, you know, player, whether you are in the different grouping of industries, some will go very fast, some will take much more time because the impact will be much more severe. And this page is still, uh, 
to be written in many ways. So when when you look at, at basically, uh, so, so we see some thrive, we see some that that are more or less, you know, in, in a new normal or you know, um, uh, losing some, winning some other, and and then we see some who are really severely hit. So your expectation to how the economy is going to to rebound from this um, in terms of timeline, what what is your best guess at this point? I would say, you know, to be uh, optimistic, I think uh, we are today watching, as Francesco says, the U.S. Because, you know, there is a big month or two difference between what's happened in China, what's happened in Italy, the rest of Europe, U.K. now and the U.S. And the U.S. is still very much in the middle of it. You know, we are looking very much at the China recovery. We are looking at what's happened in Italy and Spain. We are looking at France. We are looking at North Europe. And we will look at the U.S. But I think until we know... Uh, how the pandemic situation will unfold in the U.S. is going to be very late. You know, we, we have a lot of data around China, what's going on in the Shanghai Harbor, what's going to, you know, all the manufacturing plant in China. But, you know, we need the demand as well. And, you know, those plants are opening today, but the demand is not yet fully there. And I think this is the key, uh, I would say, uncertainty into it. I really believe that some industry will recover fast. Uh, you know, the industries that are benefiting from the crisis will recover fast. The industry like power sector, financial sector, which are in the middle of it, you know, depending on how fast the demand will recover, on how fast, you know, government, on people are back to the market, we can expect that to be uh, less than two years, which will be a good uh, outcome for all of us. Uh, industries that are very severely impacted, uh, I will bet it will be much more than two years because the business model is completely... Uh, to be rebuilt in many ways and will never be the same. Okay, so, so listening to the to, to the discussion here uh, amongst the CEOs, on the one hand, we have um, we have some some very significant trouble in terms of of, of the market and um, you know negative prices, uh, bad weather or great weather depending on on the let's say on the perspective. Um, so so. If if you look at, at let's say all, all other things being equal, um, we have uh, we have renewables on on the march forward um, because uh, because of, of of the weather. On the other hand, uh, we have people holding back on investments. So all other things being equal, uh, are we going to see a, a delay or, or a, a slowing down of the energy transition, or are we going to see a, an acceleration uh, as a as a consequence of of, of these uh, trends we're observing in the market? I think our view on this is, you know, we have done many research on this. Uh, our view is that uh, crisis, this crisis will be more of an acceleration of the trend. You know, you know we, we see a couple of forces that are changing the global economy right now, and we expect that to accelerate in the coming five years. First was digital. I think it was clear that the crisis we have been uh, will accelerate digital transformation. You know, the world leave a two months of digital experience that we cannot never think about before. So the, the fact that digital transformation will accelerate on the back of COVID is pretty clear around many leaders right now because we have never been able to have at scale a digital experience of that nature. Uh, we also believe energy transition will reshape the world. You know, we have had that discussion at Davos this year. We have that discussion around many forums. You know, energy transition is not only a power sector challenge. It's an opportunity to reshape a lower carbon economy. When you talk to the manufacturing sector with their uh, carbon emission, when you talk to the mobility sector on the car industry, when you talk to the banking industry on the asset management industry around green bonds, when you talk also about consumer goods on the needs to have more sustainable product for the new consumer, you can see that energy transition is the topics that span across the power sector, but also across all the different industry in Europe and certainly in other places. Even in, there is more awareness of it probably in many European players. Our research continue to confirm that consumer, corporation, investor, policymaker put energy transition, sustainability, and climate change at the highest priority. There. So, so there is no doubt that. This is still a topic that will reshape the future economy. Now, yes, like what I say on the other industry sector, we see disruption going on. We see renewable projects being slowed down. We see disruption in the wind and the solar uh, supply chain. So we're going to see some impact in the short term 
because companies are reassessing, reassessing their portfolio of projects, companies are looking at where they can make money. And this is where governments, which have played a major role across Europe in terms of you know, helping the economy to be more resilient first, but also help them to get out of this quicker, will play a key role because you know, depending on the collaboration between government and industry, we will see a faster or slower pace recovery. And that's also true for uh, energy transition, which is a huge investment topic, but also a huge opportunity for many uh, industry sector around Europe to reshape themselves. And certainly we are all waiting for uh, some of the announcements that will play in the next, you know, this week, but certainly more to come in the coming weeks around how we're going to make the digital transition as well as the energy transition, you know, a way to reshape our industry across Europe. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Uh, so we have a chart here um, that, that basically shows just how deep uh, the, 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 um, the changes have been in the power mix over the last, uh, over the first part of, of 2020. Uh, I think some, some numbers that really stand out are um, basically, well, there's a, there's a certain, uh, let's say, uh, drop in demand, but what really stands out is the rising share of renewables uh, to, to levels that are significantly higher than anything we've seen before. And uh, what also stands out is how coal has just very, very dramatically um, reduced uh, its part in the generation mix. Um, so these figures, uh, a minus 27.9%, uh, percent, uh, they're uh, basically uh, year on year compared to the same period last year. Uh, and that was, by the way, a year where coal also dropped uh, very significantly. Um, what is exactly explaining uh, those very, uh, very significant uh, changes? Is it is it about the the, the low prices, or, or what's what's the dynamics at play here? I will let uh, maybe the CEO of the utility sector to answer because I'm not sure I have the most uh, informed point of view on this. But those data are pretty interesting. But I'm sure some of the other CEO will have a point of view on this. Okay, we'll, we'll pass the word to, to, to some of the CEOs uh, in, in a second. Um, first, of, uh, first, I want to um, pass the word to, to Sandrine. Um, Sandrine, um, Jean-Marc said uh, the energy transition continues to be a top priority for, uh, for politicians, but also for citizens. Uh, and, um, and we're two days away from a major proposal from the, from the European Commission. You are uh, working with the with the with the services to uh, to discuss this. You have this discussion with the civil society. You're involved involved in a whole range of different circles that that basically um, are 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 um, uh, focusing on this. What uh, what needs to be done? What can policy actually do in a situation where market forces are really reshaping, uh, let's say, the, the power mix significantly, but also producing a very difficult investment climate? So, so thank you, Christian, for that very difficult question, because obviously we know that it's very complex now. Um, I just want to remind our audience of a few things, and I think that clearly the CEOs have touched upon it. So the first thing is that pre-COVID, Europe was already moving quite substantially towards a shift within the energy sector and a shift across the board in most sectors as we were looking at our climate neutrality objectives. And I guess the key message for me, and we heard Francesco said the same actually, which is we have to anchor the exit and the recovery in the Green Deal. We also have to anchor that recovery, not only in trying to find new capital and working also with the technical expert group on sustainable finance, we now have in place the taxonomy, which is the first framework actually that gives investors a very clear understanding of what green means in terms of the transition across all industrial sectors and economic sectors, including the power sector. But I think what's really important is look at perversities in the market. One of the things that we've been saying as a broader group of scientists and economists is we don't have to just go after new capital. We have to have to ensure that both our subsidies and our tax incentives and our taxation frameworks are actually shifted towards enabling that so that we're not actually continuing to prop up the old economy, fossil energy in particular, but also all types of other 
high carbon practices. And instead, we're shifting that revenue into the power sector that is trying to actually do the right thing. And I want to commend these CEOs, because although we're looking to the US, I want to be very clear, none of us want to look to the US, either in the way they've reacted towards COVID, or in the way in which they actually are steering the country towards business as usual. This is the time for Europe to continue to decouple its economic growth away from emissions. We've shown it's possible. We are the first region to demonstrate it's possible. It's also the time to embrace COVID, to understand what really is essential to consumers and to citizens. And I fully get the point that it's going to be a struggle. We're going to have to find a balance between how do we create shareholder value around real value, not just monetary value, and create a right equitable system so that we can do that. So I think that we need to both look at the European Green Deal as an anchor, but also invest EU, all of our different funds across the European Union to ensure that we're moving in the right direction. I'm also working with a new group that is actually looking at research and innovation. Innovation at the European level is now very much anchored around people, planet, and prosperity. And I think that our industries now in particular are reminded of the importance of at least people because of the social dimension and clearly because of climate neutrality and the move they've already made in terms of the energy transition, the fact that they're a fundamental part as a power sector of this broader ecosystem of the consumer, of demand, but also of shifting rural and urban communities away from high carbon products and away from high carbon energy. Policymakers need to give the right signal to investors to continue to enable the power sector to make that shift. And I think that's fundamental. We need to show leadership across Europe. I think we're already doing it in many areas. I believe that actually we can do the right thing and get out of this in the next, hopefully, five years. But I think in the meantime, we need to be very clear on conditionality. I do not believe that we should be going into bailout schemes that are continuing to enable those sectors that are not making the shift. The taxonomy and the TED group very clearly called upon actually policy leaders, governments, and also investors to already start to use the taxonomy as a basis for green and social criteria in order to enable conditionality to be fair and also based on a fair and understood framework. I think it's interesting what you say that, that um, on the one hand, we heard Francesco say we, we, we need the, the American economy to rebound uh, in order for, for, the, for the world economy to thrive again and, 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 uh, and things to happen. On the other hand, politically speaking, we, need, uh, we, we really shouldn't take the example of the U.S. neither in terms of how they, they tackle COVID, but also in terms of, of how they're trying to re, uh, reignite the economy. Looking at the efforts in Europe, um, we... We have seen, uh, I think, a, a very interesting political consensus emerge very quickly that, mm -hmm. that the recovery needs to be green. Um, but of course, the proof is in the pudding. And we all know that uh, when you have uh, a lot of uh, wheels squeaking, you're, you're, uh, you, uh, you're likely to oil the ones that are squeaking the most. And, and it happens to be sectors that, that actually uh, have less of a potential to, to rebound in a green way than, than the power sector. Are you hopeful that, that policymakers can uh, deliver on the green rhetoric? Uh, are, you, are you seeing that in the Commission and the member states? No, I, I mean, I, I, I think that there are some member states clearly that are not ready to move in that direction. I think there is a blockage both from incumbent industries and also those member states that are very much still anchored in a high carbon economy. But, but I do believe that those same member states agreed that the Green Deal was the way forward. They agreed that climate neutrality was the way forward. We had the first 27 tax finance ministers who agreed that we needed a taxonomy. So what we need to do is hold those leaders accountable. And I think that is the role of industry CEO leadership to demonstrate that actually they are shifting within this complex framework. They're doing their very best to both preserve jobs and also to decouple their emissions from the economy. And so I think that it is up to CEOs, business leaders also to put pressure on governments 
to say that moving backwards is not the right way. We have to bounce forwards in order to construct a much more resilient economy, which is actually exactly what Jean-Marc was saying. Resilience is key. We have to build in resilience. And let's be very clear from the Club of Rome perspective, this is one crisis which is going to be part of a series of crises. We're going to get hit unfortunately with more climate crises, biodiversity crises, as well potentially as more other diseases, pandemics, etc. So we have to build in that resilience. And I'll just conclude maybe with the, the other point, the, la the last point, which is where we are going to build that resilience is by ensuring that there is a real convergence between social and green. If we don't want more gilets jaunes in our streets, if we don't want more people protesting that we're actually giving in on environmental needs more than social needs, then we will never win. So we need to find those win-wins where we can stimulate jobs in a green economy and ensure also that we're creating a resilient social framework. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Uh, Francesco, perhaps over to you. Um, so two days away from, from, a, from a very, very interesting uh, political initiative from the European Commission. If, uh, if it was your wish list, what would be in that? Uh, what would be in that package? Well, I I, I wish that the, the Commission would double down on uh, on the green transition theme that was there before the COVID nineteen. Let's face it, this is a Commission that started very early with this uh, with this tune. It's not something that they brought up with it because of the COVID nineteen. So I th I really wish that they would keep working at it. Um, and I think it, the indications are that uh, they don't want to use uh, the funds for the recovery to rebuild something that we knew already needed to be changed. So they just mm. use this an opportunity to go directly where we wanted to go on a green transition across industries, not just the power segment, which is uh, one of them. I mean, it's just one. And I also wish that they would not forget the other pillar of the strategy of the of the commission that was uh, launched before the COVID-19, which was the Just Transition Fund. You remember that this was a, a very clever idea of the commission to uh, remove all the uh, impediments and all the problems that uh, a, a green transition would would generate on the side of those that are uh, sitting on the on the losing end of this of this transition and i i really think that these two these two pillars are maintained and 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 fully pushed forward in order to have a transition that is also uh, just for everyone not just for those that sit on the right side of the of the table and those others forget about them so all in all, I guess this is what, what I wish. Uh, and I, I hope that this is relatively simple in terms of what criteria need to be attached to initiatives and projects so that they can be measured in a proper way. I would say that I'm a little bit encouraged that, to the fact that some of the industries that were hesitant in this transition because of the COVID-19 seem to have jumped the ship and, and moved into this uh, this part of the of the of the transition so they they see the automotive industry much more clear of what needs to be done in terms of uh, electricity tra uh, transition i guess <clears throat> some of the stronger opposition seem to be kind of um fading away there was i should say a moment during the covid 19 when they i was fearing that you know, this COVID-19 could be used as a way of slowing down the transition because this has happened, okay? It has happened in the last month and a half, but it seems that now this is losing momentum and that uh, the commission finally has the upper hand. So what I, I think will continue, there will be a dialogue and there will be a dialectic. I mean, the EU is a dialectic place. I mean, there's never an agreement 100%. So this is something you need to understand if you are in this system that you know, there's lots of different ideas, lots of different opinions, the North, the South, the East, the West, you know, it's normal. It's part of, I think it's part of the strength of the EU. Overall, I think the EU stands to win if they stick to this in the next post COVID-19 crisis because of this clear uh, direction, uh, if they stick to that. 
Thank you, Francesco. There's an interesting question from one of the participants. Maybe that, that would be uh, interesting to hear from you, Magnus. Um, one of the participants is asking, um, what about, um, let's say, if th these the risk of, of such a, uh, a political initiative is that they, they have a lot of money, they want to do good with it. Um, the power sector and other sectors have a, a financial crunch. Um, on the other hand, if uh, if they now pour out a lot of subsidies, is there a risk that that could, let's say, exacerbate the trend with with low prices, for example, on power? Are you are you concerned about that? Well, <clears throat> I actually think that one of the things that we need to think through for the future, which is, uh, uh, I mean, one thing is to to ask for a lot of subsidies and money. I don't think that's what we should do in general. I think we should ask for um, um, deregulation uh, in the way I think short-term profits you can win by 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 making changes in regulation. And one thing would be that you would sort of build out grids um, to, to build more transmission. I think you if you if you can in increase the speed at which you can get permission to do things like that, you can accelerate the electrification part of it. And I think that a, a big consideration should be towards the electrification of society where we can really make a climate change. One thing is that we as a company, as, as an industry are really uh, changing our way of producing electricity. But if you don't also use that electricity in a smart way to, to replace uh, fossil fuels, then we will not have sort of the close the whole loop on it. Um, I think long term, yes, of course, you might find yourself in a system where you have a lot of intermittent production. If we just come back to this power mix question that you were having earlier, uh, I think it's clearly that all the you, um, we have more uh, renewable power coming into the system, and of course that's low down on the on the merit order list. So everything that's high on the merit order list goes out, and that's coal and gas. That, that's and that's driven by the CO2 price. So also this ETS issue is going to be very important that we keep the price for for CO2 emissions going forward because if we don't do that, then we will not be able to push uh, ourselves into much more renewables. But I I, I think short term we will, might see prices going up and down, uh, but I think long term uh, we will have to find some sort of another pricing model system that can be there to create both flexibility, uh, flexible power sources, and this uh, in combination with the intermittent power sources. So that's probably one of the discussions we need to take parallel with this. But I don't see immediately that it's pushing prices down because we are, we are building more renewables. I think that that's it's not the issue. But so essentially you're saying that, that, uh, that such a, a stimulus package can be, can be good, but just as important is essentially removing market perversities, as, as Sandrine was saying, and also looking at some of the things that are basically slowing down investments and build out and electrification on the ground, such as permitting and, uh, and, and some of uh, the other things that, that, that are uh, basically uh, taking out the pace. Um, Alistair, uh, you you may uh, be be less um, likely to receive some some part of the the, the stimulus money as uh, as as uh, the UK is now moving out. Um, how do you see this whole question of let's say on the one hand uh, direct economic stimulus, uh, on the other hand frameworks uh, to to structurally improve uh, the, the the market functioning? Are you hearing us, Alistair? Okay. I'm afraid we're oh, not right. hearing yeah. you. It's okay. okay. I was Alistair. muted for a while. That's fine. I'm back. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm sure all of you are hoping that as uh, as uh, as the UK pays its rather large divorce settlement, uh, will provide a, a significant stimulus for all the other people uh, uh, on the phone call to take advantage of in their respective countries. Um, look, I. I, I I think a lot of this is about policy, as I said earlier, and as I, I think Magnus referred to this. People everywhere are not, governments everywhere are not going to have lots of money to spend because they they have looked to to bail out those industries that are particularly hard hit, um, and therefore I, I think there is a job to be done for policy to provide certainty of income returns over long periods of time to the market, and the market will invest because I think we definitely need to access 
what what I still believe are huge pools of money, uh, both on the debt side and and on the equity side or mezzanine side, however you however you see that, um, and bring that into the industry. Uh, I, I think there are things that people can do. We uh, I, I'm not looking to be mean to car makers, but maybe you could bring forward the date on which petrol and diesel um, is outlawed. I think we could. Uh, the UK has a lot of offshore resource, but so does you know a lot of other places in Europe. I think we should be increasing our commitment to offshore. If we think about where we, we where we need to go, I think we will need more offshore than we've got now, an awful lot more. So I think you could uh, you could increase that. And I think there's a there's a look at market designs. If you Magnus obviously referred to, to to low prices, and you know I certainly wouldn't wouldn't want to try and build a business uh, anywhere on five or ten euros a megawatt hour right now. Um, so how do we maybe improve market designs going forward so that uh, we smooth out um, the transition and give confidence to investors as they go from where we are today to far more renewables but not completely killing some of the existing renewables um, it's not all about the latest newest renewable it is about also making sure that we can repower uh, and keep existing things going as well when maybe existing uh, support mechanisms come to an end so i think I think there's there's quite a few things people have to think about, but but no doubt um, transport we we can do more quicker offshore we can do more market design is important and then I've, certainly in the UK we've really struggled with the heat question so therefore how um, how policymakers look at addressing the heat question so we can all start working on that because we know that the, 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 this decade is hugely important. Um, hugely important uh, across the piece um, and just uh, it, obviously the UK is in a different position I, I suspect the UK won't ask for an extension and we will leave the EU um, uh, uh, at the end of this year because that's what the electorate have chosen to do um, which from 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 some perspectives is clearly a shame um, but hopefully we can stay in step with the EU in terms of looking to build that uh, looking to build that green coalition uh, and provide more jobs going forward uh, in green areas of the industry that I think will meet a lot of electoral support I think politicians um, will hopefully realize that in the uh, uh, as time goes on it's interesting what you say with the with the market design. Um, there's another uh, question from from the audience. Um, in your view, is is are, are the um, the low prices that we're seeing right now are they here to stay, or or do we can we expect a, a slight improvement? Uh, so. So look, I, I've, I've, I think some of the very low prices uh, we see now are obviously going to uh, are obviously going to change slightly as we um, uh, as we see demands going back to more sensible uh, sensible places. Um, uh, you know, as industry restarts, as the car manufacturers get going again, as we see shops and uh, coffee bars and everything restarting. Um, but undoubtedly, similar um, to 2008-9 there are issues um, that we're going to get with a uh, with a slight overhang there you you, you know we're, we're looking at bringing people back to work potentially from the 1st of June or reopening some of our offices from the 1st of June but you're only talking about 20 25 percent capacity maximum there uh, you're obviously going to get a lot of people working from home going forward that digital revolution um, which this is all accelerated that Jean-Marc referred to is is clearly there so I think I think demand that may come back in two to three years time, but I think it will be depressed certainly for this year and probably to some extent into next year. Um, although some of that perhaps depends on that wider economic uh, economic recovery and that will depress prices, which is why I think we have to work with policymakers in looking at what the long term opportunities for prices are to give people certainty to bring that investment in. Thank you. Sandrine, do you want to make a last closing uh, remark on, on what you've heard in this discussion? Absolutely. So first of all, again, I, I really want to commend the European power sector. We're all very aware of the complexities of the power price and consumer dynamic and, and all the issues that we're confronted with. And I think that Alistair is absolutely correct. We, we're not going to come out of COVID back to business as usual, whether it be in terms of our demand scenarios or whether it be in terms of the way in which we actually live our lives in general. And that's one of the points that I just wanted to make is that for me, this is the greatest incubator for swift transformation we've ever seen. And it is true that we did see, first of all, a reduction in bureaucracy, an increase in flexibility and in the way in which actually people reacted. But it wasn't designed. 
And therefore, what we need to do as we come out of COVID is, first of all, learn from this experience to see what actually did happen well and what didn't happen well. Let's take some of the examples of the economies that came out quite strongly, most of them led by women, I may add, who actually were very strong in the beginning going in in terms of the measures that need to be put in place, but had some level of humanity and transparency in the way in which they communicated. And I think we need to build on that. Also, many of them looking at new indicators to growth. If you take the New Zealand example, the Scottish example, the Finnish example, et cetera, and looking at more well-being economies. And so I think that bodes well as we come out. Also, if you look at the ratings, Moody's and others, those companies that actually were quite strong in terms of ESG principles, the ones that actually were quite strong in terms of the sustainability index or the ones that are the most resilient coming out of COVID. My big and deepest worry is what is the link between the large scale companies and the big sectors and SMEs? I think we need to figure out where that ecosystem is and how we also ensure that we continue to be part of a broader value chain when we think about this as we come out. And then I guess my last point would be the only way I see that we can bounce forward is to ensure that we do create those links between all parts of the society. I think many more people are now calling for citizen assemblies and new governance values. I think that multinationals and the way in which they work we're going to need to increase our resilience within Europe, even if we are part of an international global market. And we need to also influence within our trade agreements and our discussions at the global level, the way in which leadership is happening outside of Europe. And so I look to the CEOs to both continue to be leaders at the European level, but also to push their peers outside of Europe because a carbon price will never function 100% if we don't have it integrated across different markets in uh, internationally rather than just in Europe. And we need to cost externalities everywhere and we need to integrate that into our trading system and also the way in which we do business internationally. Thank you. I'll let that be the last word uh, from our participants. Thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, I thought that this was a very stimulating, very nuanced discussion. Certainly one theme that I'll take away is this balance between the green and the social, one we've been dealing with in your electric, but one that continues to really be on, on top of uh, this agenda. If we want to be successful in, in driving this transition forward in a time where people may be out of jobs, may be looking at a more uh, difficult economic situation for themselves. And, um, and much to the point, uh, I, I encourage everyone to join us on the 26th of June, where we uh, present our e-quality study, uh, which is looking at uh, distributional effects of, of the energy transition. What do, does climate policy do to different uh, income uh, segments and what can be done to cushion these effects? So um, tune in on the 26th of June. And, um, and if you want to hear more about ports, um, you can also join us on the 2nd of July to see how we're trying to, to find measures to drive electrification in the, in the European port uh, and, and harbor segment. Thank you very much to everybody for tuning in. Uh, this discussion will continue and I'm sure we'll all keep our eyes open uh, and closely fixed on what comes out of the Commission on Wednesday. We conclude this seminar for now. Take care. Thank you and bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, Sandrine. Ciao, ciao.